And we're live again. Hello, everybody, once again, to, sadly enough, but uh, also excitingly, the very last public lecture series for this year, at least. So today we have a, a pretty special uh, guest, actually, because we had somebody from Tweak, uh, Valentin, already talk on the on the show, and we had somebody else from Analnet being uh, Armin talk on it as well. No, Michiel, no, sorry, not Armin, who <laughs> dodged the bullet there. Um, but now we are completing the circle in that I always thanked these people for making it all happen. The people being, of course, and I'm at the European Commission and the Next West Foundation and Tweak. And now we're closing the circle with Paul representing the European Commission. Uh, I forgot one, the Next West Foundation, that was uh, Ilko, of course. He was also there. So, yes, I hope you all really enjoy this one. Before we start, though, there's one more thing that is also nearing like, like next week, and that's NextCon. So I hope to see some of you there. I just want to make sure once again that there's still some late bird tickets available. Go check it out. I hope to see you there. Uh, but without further ado, I'm actually going to pull Paul in here. Uh, hello, Paul. Hi. Uh, Hi, Brian. As well. And so good luck. OK. So you hear me correctly? I can start? Yes, everything's OK. OK, I guess so. So hi, everyone. My name is Paul de la Yera. And I started working for the European Commission 10 years ago as an external consultant. Today, I'm going to talk about the state of NICS at the European Commission. But before diving into the main subject, let me talk about the deepening relation between the European Commission and open source in general. One of the takeaways of this talk would be that the Commission recognized the practical value of open source. Making a talk about NICS already demonstrates how we like this freedom to innovate and how we like sharing this innovation with colleagues and with others, such as you, the NixOS community. But did you know that this is not something new? Open source and the commission go back more than, more than 20 years ago. And over these 20 years, the commission has grown to appreciate open source, to experiment new tools and innovate just like with Nix, but also because of the flexibility the scalability, the vendor independence, and oftentimes lower costs, and the list goes on. At European Commission, Digit is the central IT service provider for the Commission. You could compare it to the Ministry of IT. This is where I work, and I can tell you that we use open source everywhere. 75% of our servers run on Linux. The PHP language is used for mostly all Commission's websites. Node.js is used by EUI, a front-end front web framework used by all internal web applications. And software developers use more and more open source tools every day. Around 1999, a colleague from GRC created the first building blocks of what eventually became Apache, one of the most popular web servers. In 2007, the commission published the EUPL license. Around 2011, Eurostat began sharing some of its tools as open source. And since 2019, the ECPHP team, the team I work in, has released a dozen of open source projects and materials used within the European Commission, but also in other organizations, where we were one of the first team doing that, actually. And over the past two decades, the use of software expanded from data center to commission desktops, including web browser like Firefox, Media Player, VLC, LibreOffice, Git, and so on. And today, if we had to situate on this graph where we stand, it would be here in the middle of Contribute and Transform. This is the reason why you see in this diagram that there is a progression from an organization that consumes open source to one that produces its own solution on top of open source, to one that now wants to become involved in upstream projects. And this is reflected in the open source strategy, officially published in 2020, which is encouraging the use and reuse of software solutions, knowledge and expertise to deliver better European services using open source. It also indicates a commitment to support open source developer communities. <laughs> Impacting the whole organization, the strategy led to the creation of a dedicated team, the Open Source Project of Program Office, the OSPO, and it impacts the entire organ organization. On the 16th of September in Czech Republic, we officially unveiled code.europa.eu, 
a public GitLab instance where we aim to share our software publicly. I guess you got the big picture. We want open source to be everywhere at European Commission and not only at Digit. A good example of this is the Cloud Framework project Simple, where open source is a strict requirement. But let's check how European, European Commission is sponsoring Nix projects. About 800 pro open source projects are founded through DG Connect and NGI. DG Connect is like one of the ministry at European Commission. Examples of projects are WireGuard, Tor, FDroid, OpenPGP, Matrix, CryptPad, and so on. There's a lot of projects. European Commission, through DG Connect, has partnerships with, with NLNet and the NixOS Foundation. And it is through those partners or intermediaries that eight projects related to Nix are founded. If you'd like to get your project founded also, there are open calls right now, and your submission are open till the 1st of December. <coughs> Those projects are, of course, TVX, DreamNix, Mobile NixOS, uh, Software Vulnerability Discovery, Security NixOS Services, UFI Support Boot for NixOS, RobotNix, and TrustX. But now, let's see how the European Commission is using Nix itself. I will begin with some context and the reason why it is used. And that means giving you an overview of our environment. So what you see here in this graphic, I will explain everything, but basically in order to reduce the amount of bugs and unforeseen circumstances, we want to unify the developer environments. Managements also want to reduce the diversity of environments and ensure that we use a development environment which closely match what's in production. This is quite a challenge since there are a few different operating systems in the game, as you can see in this graphic. Some developers use Microsoft Windows, some Linux on Amazon Workspace using the YUM package manager. Some are using Linux on their commission laptop, which is running on an APT-based distro. And some are using their own laptop running an arbitrary operating system, Windows, Linux, or even macOS. In addition to that, some people use Docker and some others Ansible. And these tools, while very handy for some specific tasks, are not helping at all when it comes to reproducibility and unifying the developer's development environment. Using the proper technology at the proper place is a golden rule. And while some colleagues were busy exploring new tools to fix all the aforementioned issues, I was experimenting myself with Nix at home. So 18 months ago, I got rid of the Linux I was using and started by installing NixOS on my own laptop, then on my backup laptop, then on my basement server, and finally, very recently, on my Raspberry running Pi Hole. And you know, since all the years working with open source, I have in my mind the list of open source projects that I like the most. First one being Blender, the 3D suit, because this is thanks to that software that I ended up using Linux so many years ago. Second one is Git for its, for its awesomeness. And the third one is, without hesitation, Nix now. I love this project and its community so much that I've been angry with myself not to have discovered it earlier. How is it possible? What was I doing all these years? Anyway, enough whining. Here's how I introduced Nix to my colleagues. In the Development Competency Center iDigit, the team I work in, I help teams and developers of all horizon to be successful in their development, promoting the use of best practices, doing live code review, proof of concept, and abstracting common parts in open source projects. One day, a team having issues aligning their development environment came to see me. They were all using the same Linux flavor, but some of them were not up to date. Some of them did a major upgrade. Some of them were using the bleeding edge, the bleeding edge packages. Some Others were not able to upgrade for some obscure reason. And finally, some of them had multiple versions of a software and were unable to compile specific extension to run the project. I guess you get the big picture. It would have been extremely time consuming to align everyone and time is money. And this is how it started actually. Instead of losing time understanding the reasons of all the mess, I decided to use Nix with them for the first time. And do you know what? they are extremely happy ever since and more productive than ever. Before going into the details of what I did, let's take a break 
and list what are the requirements of an average developer. This is the same kind of question that I ask myself as well. So developers usually want, at any time of the day, a working development environment. Developers usually want to be able to spawn their projects quickly, as many times as they want. They also want to quickly focus on what they are good at without adding too much overhead. Developer usually wants to have the same software as their, as their colleagues with the same version because it's easier to reproduce an issue in case of bugs. Developers usually want to avoid breaking the laptop when they have to install different or multiple versions of a particular software. And you know, an happy and productive developer is a developer who uses its own tool. I guess there is no need to explain further. We all know what it is. A real life example would be me actually. Using the European Commission Linux laptop felt, felt like a burden to me because I couldn't reproduce quickly and easily my usual development environment. Spoiler alert, I'm now using exclusively that laptop since I discovered Nix. True story. Given this, I ran a series of experiments with my colleagues, iterating over and over again, until we reached some sort of stability and ease of use with Nix. By shipping a custom Nix Flex per project, developers are able to customize their development environment at will. For example, this presentation that you are seeing right now is an open source LaTeX presentation, which is hosted on code.europa.eu with a flake containing the required dependencies to build and contribute to it without any worries. I also use DIRENV and its brother, NixDIRENV, to load software dependencies without typing any single command. This is fast, handy, and this is a really unique tool that unleashes its full potential when it's, it is used with Nix. I also created a trivial home manager profile, setting up a custom shell with some carefully chosen plugins, custom aliases, and NixDRM integration. Thanks to that, it reduces the amount of time a developer needs to spend setting up its workstation because this profile sets everything up with one single command and in a few seconds. And very recently in the OSPO team, we wanted to host our own instance of a node service. And we ended up setting up a bunch of server, actually. One reverse proxy, one hedgehog instance, and some others, all managed by a single flick file. And guess what? We deploy on Fridays without any worries. While setting up our infrastructure as code, we contributed also to NixOS by creating pull requests to fix minor issues we had. And just like you most probably know, the road to success is never a straight line. The problem I have with the adoption of Nix at the European Commission could be summarized in one quote from Albert Einstein. Here it is. The word as we have created it is a process of our thinking. It cannot be changed without changing our thinking. This is something we should always have in mind, actually. Yeah? And Mr. Einstein was right. And more than 100 years later, he, he's still right, despite all the efforts that are made to try to break relativity. And it's often the same pattern with when something new needs to be introduced somewhere. Remember that people feared electricity when it was invented. There will always be ignorance, and ignorance leads to fear. And it's the same when it comes to Nix at European Commission. All of this to introduce my next slide, which is about the pain points introducing Nix at European Commission. So the fear of the unknown. You know, every new piece of software fixes issues, but also brings in a couple of new issues. Nix is quite new at European Commission, and people are sometimes a bit reluctant to use something they never heard of yet. Flake is a feature that has been introduced in November 2021, and nowadays it is still considered as experimental. Given that, asking to such an institution to use an experimental feature in their day-to-day -day work might be a little more difficult. Learning the Nix programming language can be also tedious for developers who never use programming at all. But this might not be true. We never use functional programming at all, sorry. But this might not be true since last week with the new tutorial that has been published on Nix.dev. I will come back to this a bit later. About documentation, 
there are still a lot of work to be done. This is the reason why there is a new documentation team in place in the community. There is in charge of flattening the curve. And that new Nix tutorial is actually their first outcome and many more are coming. I can't wait to see that. <laughs> What's next? At European Commission, the idea is to obviously continue to experiment with Nix, testing things and see how it could be adopted more broadly. I believe that the issues related to the fear of the unknown will disappear with time. The flag feature is about to lose its, its experimental flag. This is going to encourage more and more people to join in. The programming language, this is like any other language. As long as we have a good documentation, we can learn it correctly. In my team, the development profile based on Home Manager will be improved and its documentation as well. The idea would be to tell about this profile to other teams and show how it can be used in conjunction of what's already existing. I wish I could ship a flake file per project to reduce to almost zero the amount of time new developers need to spend to set up their environment. This is already the case for all the open source projects in my team, but it would be a big plus if it could be done on every project by default. About contributing, we already contributed back to NixOS with a couple of pull requests. The idea is to continue to work with this mindset and openness, reusability and sharing. This last and positive slide concludes my presentation. Feel free to ask your question and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Paul, for the amazing presentation. I'm going to pull your slides off of the stage. There we go. Um, so yeah, we will be taking questions. Um, I have not seen any just yet, um, but I do have one question myself. And that question would go as, uh, you mentioned that currently at the European Commission, you have many machines and they're running different distributions. Uh, how well do you think like NixOS fits in there? Does it play nice with the other machines or is it uh, a bit more difficult to integrate? Right, we haven't been that far yet. We are using it only on developers' laptops for the moment. And basically the idea is to, to have a layer of abstraction when it comes to installing developers' dependencies. So developers can use, can develop on their uh, European Commission laptop, but they can also develop on another machine and spawn their project really quickly and easily. Now, when it comes to have NixOS as servers at European Commission, we only have a bunch of server but this is still uh, experimental and we are still playing with it. Uh, this is not uh, adopted broadly, but I think there's a lot of work to do yet to have uh, this um, adopted more broadly. Okay, that makes, that makes sense. And would you say that um, convincing, I guess you could call it, uh, your colleagues to use Nix, was that a, a difficult task or were they keen on trying it out? No, 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 they were really keen to, to try it out because they were actually fed up sometimes to, to have plenty of different ways of installing things. And uh, the good thing with Nix is that they have one single, one single file to, one single command to execute to have everything that they want. And especially with Nix their env, as soon as they enter the directory of their project, everything gets loaded and they don't have anything to do. Everything is there and every developers are aligned. And this is really the added value of this setup, actually. And we are not entering in competition or we are not going against, sorry, we are not going against um, another tool or software which is in place. This is really, this is really going in conjunction with the other tools that are present uh, on their laptop. Okay, that makes sense. Um, now some questions are coming in. So. Oh. The first one uh, coming from over at the YouTube platform from Ancostis. I have to read names again. So, <laughs> uh, yep. can you summarize the pros and cons of Nix and by extension NixOS uh, versus Docker? Oh, this is a this is a very long subject, I guess, um, and I couldn't tell you exactly all the difference precisely. I know that there's a lot of um, article that are talking about that on the net, and there is also even a nice presentation on YouTube about that that completely describes the differences. But basically for me, uh, the advantage of using Nix 
versus Docker is that with Nix, you don't need to have virtual machines on your computer. Uh, everything is there. Nothing is virtualized. This is faster. This is actually easier to use than Docker. And um, and this is one of the most um, argument that I would say. I know that there are some plenty of other arguments of uh, for Nix, um, for Nix, but I don't know them. For example, with Docker, you cannot really ensure reproducibility, while with Nix, you can do it actually. But uh, I, I can send you the the link to that YouTube presentation. I I have it in my link, so I can I can send it to you, uh, Costis. Yes, that would be nice. Um, then another question coming from Ilko Dolstra, also from YouTube. Uh, how important is support for macOS and Windows for you? Oh, um, basically, macOS and Windows are platforms that are used most probably at European Commission, but we are not supporting them. The will of the management is to align all the developers using the same operating system and development tools which means using Linux or Amazon Workspace. And um, macOS is not a supported platform. So for us, it's not, it's not important. And Windows, the same. Actually, we are using Windows just for our day-to-day tasks uh, like um, emails. And uh, th that's it mostly. We are using it to remote connect to, to servers, but uh, we are not working on Windows and we are not supporting it. Okay, interesting. Um, then I forgot the order, um, but on our own cast instance, Akenji is asking, well, first of all, they're saying thank you for the presentation. And then apart from convincing people to use a specific technology, do you feel you need to also explain the benefits of reproducibility to them? I think I am not, I, I don't want to convince people. This is important, actually. Uh, I, I don't want to convince people to use Nix or to not use Nix or to use Docker or anything. I just want to use the right technology at the proper place at the proper moment. And I think that Nix is definitely fixing a lot of issues that we were having since a decade. And uh, I'm trying to show to the developers how they can use it quickly and how it can be helpful for them. But I am not going to convince people to use it or not. I guess that if the tool is re really fits what we are looking for, it will it will be done implicitly, and there will not need to convince people. Yes, there is a saying about it, isn't there? Um, everything is a nail when all you have is a hammer, right? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, over on Matrix, Armin is asking, what are the chances of the European Commission hosting a NixOS hackathon? Wow. That's a very good question. I, I wish I could forward this to, to my colleague, which are not here. <laughs> but I, I can ask and I can see what we can do. Uh, I, I am more in the technical part of uh, the thing. Uh, when it comes to such event and such things, I am not the right person, sorry, to, to answer. But I definitely looking forward to that. It would be amazing. We could make a little custom logo with like the Nexus logo and the European flag in there. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. That would be nice. Um, then Infancil or Sylvan is asking, Flakes is labeled as experimental, but not treated as such. How will you handle it when Flakes makes significant breaking changes before stabilization? Stabilization, I'm sorry. Yeah, we are currently using uh, four repositories with flakes inside, and there is basically nothing fancy and nothing complicated. So if tomorrow there is an in incompatible change in the flake structure or something like that, I guess we will have to adapt. That's for sure. Uh, there is no other way anyway. But I have doubts. I have doubts that the structure will change dramatically or uh, from, day, from one day to another. So. This is how we are doing right now. OK. Then still on Matrix, uh, do you use custom caching infrastructure like Cashix or self-hosted Hydra or something similar? Actually, this is something that uh, I already explained to, to some people here that they could have their own binary cache um, hosted at the commission. So we build the stuff only once, and it can be distributed. But uh, right now we are not. We are. I am using Cashix because all the projects that we are doing with NixOS and Nix are open source. So I am using Cashix for that. And um, 
there are some really particular stuff that are compiled on each uh, developer's laptop, like Oracle extensions. But um, that's the only thing that uh, we are compiling on developer's laptop. Nothing else. I'm using Cachex for the moment. I wish European Commission could have its own uh, binary cache, but I think it means that it would get much more involved into Nix OS then. And right now we are still at the beginning. This is still considered as experimental. And um, yeah, we are only maybe 10 people using it every day, um, including me. So this is really the, the beginning of a long story, I hope. OK, cool. Um... I saw another one. Uh, where did it go to? That's common same question. Um, so yeah, over on LinkedIn, um, Mathieu um, Ledru. Yep. I hope I'm uh, Ledru. I hope I'm. Hello, Mathieu. <laughs> yep. But how easy hard uh, is it to set up? No, how how is it easy slash hard to set up when working on Docker, for instance? What is the entry level of adopting Nix compared to other tools in the market? So I guess uh, they're asking about the learning curve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are many ways to use it, uh, I think. And um, you could use Nix basically in two simple commands. If you if you are using, for example, the Flake feature, you can set up your own development environment with one single command. If you are using Flakes and Nix dear env, for example, you could just set up your development environment with zero commands. It it really depends how you want to use it now. If you want to make custom thing, you will have to learn the Nix programming language. And uh, I know you, so I know that you are used to functional programming, so it won't be hard for you. But I am, yeah, the, the learning curve, we, we know that the learning curve is, is a bit steep because um, this is a functional programming language, different paradigm. And, um, but it's just like another programming language. You just have to learn it. It's, it's different maybe from what you are used to. And what is hard is this difference. The language itself is not complicated. It's, it's the difference with what you are used to, which is uh, complicated to learn, actually. This is the change, which is a bit complicated. But besides that, the entry level for adopting Nix, I would say in, it's a matter of a few days to, to learn the command. It's re there are really easy commands to learn. And the documentation, while it's not perfect, but it's tending to be perfect with the new documentation in team in place, uh, is there and you can you can read it and, and get into it really quickly. Yeah? I, I would I would suggest people who want to try Nix to first install it on their Linux laptop to play with the Nix command. And then when they are used to it, they just maybe install Nix OS on their laptop. Uh, on my side, I haven't been playing with Nix before. I directly installed Nix OS on my machine. And I, I think this is the best way to learn. You, you just deep dive in it and you, you try to, to get your head out of the water. This is the best way to learn. And this is what I did. And uh, I started like that. And then uh, I asked for help and I still ask for help and stupid questions sometimes on Matrix. But uh, this is how I get help. I think that's one of the amazing, uh, at least in my experience, uh, it's amazing how welcoming the community is. Uh, definitely you ask a question on Matrix or on Discord, and yeah, you'll definitely. answer pretty, pretty fast, which is very nice. So I can double down on that. Yeah. Um, then there's a, another question on YouTube from Frozen Co. Cow, sorry. Uh, how do you handle private repositories or packages, or is all code just public? How do you handle private repositories or packages, or all code is public? Or, yeah. So basically, all the open source projects have a Flake file inside, which is basically loading the interpreter and all the development tools that we need. So this is public. But for uh, private repositories, they have uh, their own Flake file, and they load uh, their interpreter and all this stuff from the internet. And we are not using uh, something fancy for the moment. We are just using uh, Nix packages and all the stuff that Nix packages can bring. Uh, and nothing fancy for the moment. And this is something that I haven't been, um, yeah. We never had to deal with uh, private repositories or package yet. I guess it will come one day and uh, I guess I will have to, to deal with it. But right now, no, the, the tendency is to move towards open source. So right now we haven't had the, the situation where we need to, to, to have a private repo. 
that on code.europa.eu we can have private repo. And uh, right now, the presentation that I made is in a private repo. I am planning to squash all the Git commits into one and make it public so everyone can, can see it and download it if they want to. And um, and uh, voila, there are some private repo like the infrastructure of our NixOS servers. It's in a private repo, but uh, that's it. Okay, cool. Then over on Oncast, Akanji asks, is there a specific functionality that you can miss currently at the foundation from Nix? And also extend it, is there a functional, functionality of Nix that you just can't miss? Can you repeat the question? So is there, Akanji is asking, is there at this moment in Nix a functionality that you heavily rely on that you cannot miss? And I'll extend it myself as well. Is there something that you just can miss. No, wait, it's the way I want. Akanji is asking, can you miss something of Nix, like a certain feature functionality? And uh, I'd like to extend the advice or something you just can't miss from Nix. Cannot hmm. miss. What I can't miss from Nix uh, is the flake feature. Uh, I really love this feature. And I think this is fixing a lot of, a lot of things. And uh, I hope it will be stabilized very soon and integrated in, in, the, in Nix. I, I can't wait for that, actually. And this is really the, the the really the real added value of the tool. I really love this thing. And now, what I miss inside Nix, um, okay, from my own point of view, is um, better error messages when you are uh, developing uh, Nix files and you have issues. I wish I could have better error messages to help me to figure out what I did wrong, where I did wrong, and uh, this is something that I miss actually. And uh, uh, an, an easy way to, to debug or to do stuff like that. I consider myself as a newcomer. Uh, it's been 18 months that I know Nix, so I'm still a newcomer. I'm still a newbie. And uh, maybe there are things that I do not do correctly, and I'm still learning every day. That's the good part of it. But when I when it comes to debugging Nix files, sometimes I have difficulties to 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 see where the issue is and things like that. I wish I could have better error messages. Okay. Um, that's a small nudge over to Ilko, I guess, as well. <laughs> it was in the chat earlier. Um, I do not see more questions coming in at this moment. And I also do not have any, any, you know, any more of myself. So I guess we can call it quits then. Uh, Thanks I'd for like all the questions. questions. Yeah, I'd like to, of course, thank you again, Paul, for giving more insight on in what's happening with Nix inside the European Commission and how you guys work uh, behind Thanks. the scenes a little bit as well. So that's very nice. Um, again, thank you, Paul. I'll be closing down and uh, I hope to see you again soon. Me too. Bye. Bye. So that was the very last lecture of this year's Summer of Nix 2022 Public Lecture Series. This closing the circle of me thanking these people uh, and I'm going to get it right this time. There is Michiel from the Analyst Foundation. There is now Paul from the European Commission. There's Ilko from the Nixwest Foundation. And there was Valentin from Tweak. Now, of course, there's many more people behind the scenes that also helped making this thing, making this series a reality. Um, I'd like to thank Matthias and Julia that you saw last week uh, instead of me. I'd also like to thank CTEM that helped me set up the entire streaming infrastructure. And I'd also like to thank all the participants, of course, for stress testing the streaming infrastructure very well. But that's it. I do not have anything else to tell you, except, of course, that next week is NixCon. There's still a few tickets left. Uh, I hope to see you all there. And if there's more questions for Paul, you can always still head over to the Matrix channel. I believe Paul is already part of that channel, so that should be fine. But having said all of that, Thank you very much for listening to these and watching these series. And it was for me a, an opportunity and a very much a, just an experience to host these things. So thank you for letting me host them. And I hope to see you all next year.